Okay, following uh, the apology, there is a long pause. And, um, if one, one likes to think that justice is meted out quickly kind of thing, but the timing of the apology was awkward for the Athenians in an interesting kind of way. Um, uh, the blurb at the beginning of the Crito on your page 45 um, about the time of the trial of Socrates, a state galley, uh, had set out on an annual religious mission to a small Aegean island of Delos, uh, sacred to Apollo, and uh, while it was on its way, no execution was allowed to take place, so that Socrates was kept in prison for a month after his trial. This is both good and bad. On the one hand, we get more dialogues. Right? So Socrates is able to have more conversations about the nature of justice, the nature of duty, that sort of thing. Um, there's even one right at the point of his execution um, called the the Phaedo, which is in the five dialogues. This is the this book is basically everything leading up to the trial of Socrates and following it up to the point of his death. So um, the Crito uh, is basically um, on the eve of Socrates' death, right? So, um, it, well, it's it, it just before, anyway. Um, Crito has shown up to um, the, the prison with an escape plan. He's bribed the guards. He's got friends in another city-state that are going to keep an eye on Socrates and make sure he's safe, etc., etc., etc. But Crito also shows up with an argument to persuade Socrates to action. Right. Um, so that's basically the premise upon which this is. Now, um, like I say, there's something interesting about why Socrates had to sit in prison for a month while the state galley um, uh, went out on this religious mission to Delos. Delos apparently had a minotaur. And um, uh, Athens had to send some sort of a tribute to this minotaur so it didn't go crazy and like kill everyone kind of thing. And while this religious mission was going on, the state was to remain as pure as possible, right? as virtuous as possible. So that during that period of time, the city-state of Athens uh, it committed itself not to execute anyone, right? which yeah, on its face would lead me to believe at very least that the city-state of Athens knew it was doing something wrong here. So um, this is this is why um, we, uh, we 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 get um, this particular um, dialogue, right? Because there was that month lag time kind of thing. Otherwise, Socrates' sentence would have been fairly immediate. Um, but uh, we get the impression that everybody is pretty comfortable with Socrates having visitors. Um, Everybody's quite friendly with the guards, and um, Plato even hints that the authorities wouldn't have minded so much if Socrates just got up and left for another city-state. Recall, nobody was really expecting Socrates to um, be put to death as a result of this. Everybody was expecting Socrates to say, okay, my bad, I'll go into exile, I'll go to like Thebes or somewhere. Um, but he didn't do that. Uh, there was that basically gamut right at the end of the apology where he suggested his additional sentence, refused exile, and suggested that, um, that, that, that he knows that to be an evil. Right. Whereas um, the effectively he suggested a possible penalty for himself um, equivalent to a thirty dollar parking ticket as the counter penalty to death. So um, I tend to think of that moment at the end of the apology as Socrates pointing out to the Athenians that it's they've done something unjust. Right and uh, basically giving them the opportunity to 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 retract uh, their unjust verdict are you sure right i'll pay 30 minas if it gets you out of this right um but uh the, the gamut didn't work out and enough people were perturbed enough with socrates to sentence him to death um it turns out um so uh, it, early in the mornings, uh, Crito comes, Socrates recounts a weird dream that he had. Um, there's a debate about whether tomorrow the ship's going to arrive back at uh, Athens or the day after tomorrow. Um, that's all here, neither here nor there. Um, it soon is the point. 
Um, and um, it, 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 Credo shows up with this argument, which is really quite impassioned. Right? So right off the bat, um, I'm going to read this. It's just a little over a page, but nonetheless, um, I think it's important that we take a good close look at Credo's argument for why Socrates um, should escape. This is 47. If you die, it will not be a sing single misfortune for me. Not only will I be deprived of a friend, the like of whom I shall never find again, but many people who do not know you or me very well will think I could have saved you if I were willing to spend the money, but that I did not care to do so. For surely there can be no worse reputation than to be thought to value money more highly than one's friends, for the majority will not believe that you yourself were not willing to leave prison uh, while we were eager for you to do so. Right? Um, <laughs> you know, it, <clears throat> it, it, Socrates responds, well, it's, let's not care about the majority. Most reasonable people will think that things were done as they were done. Crito responds, you see, Socrates, that one must pay attention to the opinion of the majority. Your present situation makes clear that the majority can inflict not the least, but pretty well the greatest evils um, um, if one is slandered among them. All right. Now, Socrates' response to that is fairly interesting. What uh, Would that the majority could inflict the greatest evils, for they would be capable of the greatest good, and that would be fine. But now they ca cannot do either. They cannot ma uh, make men either wise or foolish, but they inflict things haphazardly. That's Socrates' uh, whole argument from the Apology beforehand. Right, they they can't do things. They just do things haphazardly. Right, when uh, decisions, when choices, when votes, when actions are based on opinion and belief, they're idiosyncratic. They're haphazard. Right, whereas when reasonable people act, they act based on reason and they do so consistently. And that's what you expect one from a government, but two from good, just and virtuous people, right? But in any case, right, um, what um, Crito first uh, lays out in front of Socrates, uh, don't worry about us. If you're worried about us, your friends, and that we'll have trouble with the informers, it, it really, the, the, the risk is um, justified, right? Um, it, so basically, Right, follow my advice and um, it, act in this manner. Right? Now, the argument really gets going over on um, uh, duh, 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 uh, the next page, but um, duh, 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 boo, um, also have no fear about money. Uh, the money we have available is sufficient. Um, and uh, what's more, um, there's more available if need be. Right? So these are practical concerns that uh, Crito is dealing um, with. And by the way, I've got friends in uh, another city state. If you want to go to Thessaly, I'm on 48 now. I have friends there who will greatly appreciate you and keep you safe um, so that no one in Thessaly will harm you. Besides, Socrates, I do not think what you're doing is just ding, 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 ding. This is going to be the most interesting and persuasive argument to Socrates. All right, so um, this uh, two long paragraphs on 48 are the core of Crito's argument. I do not think what you're doing is just to give up your life when you can save it and to hasten your fate as your enemies would hasten it and indeed have hastened it. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> and their wish to destroy you. Moreover, I think you're betraying your sons by uh, going away and leaving them uh, when you could bring them up and educate them. <clears throat> you thus show no concern for what their fate may be. They'll probably have the usual fate of orphans. 
either one should not have children or one should share with them to the end the toil of upbringing and education. You choose, um, you seem to me to choose the easiest path, whereas one should choose the path a good, um, a, a good and courageous man would choose, particularly when one claims throughout one's life to care for virtue. I feel ashamed on your behalf and on behalf of us, your friends, lest all that has happened to you be thought due to cowardice on our part. The fact that your trial came to court when it need not have done so, the handling of the trial itself, and now this absurd ending, which will be thought to have gotten beyond our control through some cowardice and unmanliness on our part, since we did not save you or you save yourself when it was possible and could have been done if we had been of the slightest use. Consider, Socrates, whether this is not only evil, but shameful for both, uh, for both uh, you and for us. Take counsel with yourself, or rather the time for counsel is past and the, the decision should already have been taken. And there is no further opportunity for this whole business must be ended tonight. If we delay now, then there will no, uh, then it will no longer be possible. It will be too late. Let me persuade you on every count, Socrates, and do not act otherwise. That's a pretty impassioned sort of um, argument that Crito has brought. Right? First off, it, it, people are going to think we're jerks who care more for money than for, for, for friendship. Right. That's a bad reputation to have. We should worry about our reputation because these slanders can land people in the slammer facing execution quite clearly. Right? Don't worry about the money. Don't worry about the potential trouble we'll have with the informers that will be disenfranchised or something along those lines. These are all worth the risk. Now, the justice of the matter, you're letting your enemies win. Right. What we want to do is act justly towards you because it's important for justice to do well by your friends and not let your enemies win. You have a duty to your sons, right, who are your family and loved ones, who you have to do well by, and your enemies are going to win. So what Crito has done here is shown his particular theory of justice. Everything following, I do not think what you're doing is just, is an argument pertaining to a particular theory of justice. Now, Socrates responds to this, right? That basically, you know, most people are idiots, right? Most people are idiots. That you're slandered by the opinion of, in terms of the opinion, the opinion of the majority is not, not a big deal. Right? Because really what we should value is not the opinion of every Joe Schmo that's out there, but the good opinions of wise people. Right? And these good opinions of those who are wise men, not those bad ones, of foolish men, right, need to be taken into account. The way that you don't listen to just everybody about your health, you listen to an expert, a doctor, about your health and well-being. Right now, effectively, right, what Socrates does is lays out an argument by which, given this situation, he and Crito must become the experts. There's an interesting passage on 50 here. So, with other matters, not to enumerate them, um, and certainly with um, uh, with actions just and unjust, shameful and beautiful, good and bad, about which we are now deliberating. We should follow the opinion, or should we follow the opinion of the many and fear it, or that of the one, if there is one, who has that kind of knowledge of these things, and before whom we should feel fear and shame more than before all of the others. If we do not follow his directions, we shall harm and corrupt that part of ourself that is improved by just action and destroyed by unjust action. Or is there nothing to this? All right. So, effectively, th this is a continuation of an argument from the Apology. All right. It's why should we fear death? Because death is an unknown. What should we fear? We should fear acting unjustly. All right. 
because we know that to be bad. He furthers this argument here by demonstrating that, you know, the, the, there is this part of ourselves that is improved by just action and harmed by unjust actions. We should care more about our psyche or our soul than we even should about our body, because it is that part of us that is most us, most distinctively human, right? Bodies, bodily functions we share with animals, right? But psychic functions, right? That part of us that is concerned for justice is that which is best and noble about us. So effectively what we're doing when we act unjustly is harming ourselves. It's an interesting twist, right? Um, he continues down the page, and um, and is life worth living for us if we, um, uh, uh, for us with that part of us corrupted uh, that an unjust action harms or or just action benefits, or do we think that part of us, whatever it is, that is concerned with justice and injustice, is inferior to the body? It's clearly more valuable, he argues. We should then not think so much about what the the majority say about us, but what he will say who understands justice and injustice, uh, the one that is, and the truth itself. So that, in the first place, you were wrong to believe that we should care for the opinion of the many about what is just, beautiful, good, and their opposites, but, someone might say, there are many, uh, the, the many are able to put us to death. And then he reiterates the argument about fear of death. Now, on 51, Socrates points out the, and focuses the argument on its direct point um, by in the middle of the page by pointing out that like all of these 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 considerations um, in truth belong to uh, people who easily put men to death and would bring them uh, to life again if they could without thinking, I mean the majority of men, right? who act haphazardly because they emote and um, opine their way through decisions. We, on the other hand, are concerned with justice and value reason. Right? For us, however, since our argument leads to this, the only valid, valid consideration, as we were just saying now, is whether we should uh, be acting rightly in giving money and gratitude uh, uh, to those who would lead me out of here and ourselves for helping with the escape, or whether, in truth, we should be doing wrong in all this. If it appears that we should be acting unjustly, then we have no need to take into account whether uh, we shall have to die if we stay here and keep quiet or suffer in another way rather than do wrong. And so effectively, what Socrates wants to do is uh, lay out right, a proper argument about whether or not he should escape. Justice being the only valid consideration, they're going to follow the reasons to their conclusion and do what reason dictates. That's why I say that this dialogue is one about duty, right? because we should be persuaded not by opinions, not by desires, not by emotions, but by reasons. Reason dictates that we have to do X, then we should do X. That's duty. Right. So, effectively, what Socrates wants to point out is that Crato is holding a particular theory of justice. I laid that out a moment ago. This this is going to be a quick video. There's There's a mechanism to this argument that's fairly straightforward. Crito, his, his theory of justice is to do well by our friends and not let our enemies win, right? Now, effectively, this theory of justice creates an us and a them, right? Me and my tribe, I'm going to fulfill my obligations and do well by my friends, etc., etc., but those evil guys over there, we're, we're going to beat them. We're, we're not going to let them win, right? That sort of thing. Right. Now, Socrates, on the other hand, wants to point out that effectively this theory of justice that Crito has offered is contradictory to other theories of justice that he and Crito have argued in the past. Socrates is going to present sort of 
a straightforward theory of justice that, that on its head is actually quite demanding. All right? He starts on 52 by saying, so one must never do wrong. All right? If you're concerned with doing what's just, what's right in every instance, you should not do wrong. You should always do what is just. Right? One must always do the good. One must never do wrong. I mean, same sides of the same coin. Right? Further, nor must one, when wronged, inflict wrong in return, as the majority believe, since one must never do wrong. Right? So, but wait, they wronged me. Is it right for me to wrong them? Am I justified in acting unjustly? Well, you can't be justified in acting unjustly because one must never do wrong, all right? So, all right, when wronged, we do not inflict wrong in return, all right? Because we must always do the good, all right? And mistreating people is no different from wrongdoing. So, to sum up here, Socrates points out on the bottom of, so, uh, so one should never do wrong in return, in return, nor mistreat any man, no matter how one has been mistreated by him. And Credo, see that you do not agree with this, contrary to your belief. For I know that only a few people hold this view, or will hold it, and there's no common ground between those who hold this view and those who do not, but they invariably despise each other's views. So then consider very carefully whether we have this view in common and whether you agree and let this be the basis for our deliberation that neither to do nor wrong, uh, do wrong nor return a wrong is ever right nor bad treatment in return for bad treatment. Do you disagree? And do you not sh uh, and uh, do not share this view as the basis for a discussion? I've held it for a long time and still hold it. But if you think otherwise, tell me now. If, however, you stick to our former opinion, then listen to the next point. All right? Credo's like, okay, okay, I see your point. I see your point. All right. Then the next point, Socrates adds. All right. When one has come to an agreement uh, that is just with someone, should one fulfill it or cheat on it? Keeping in mind we should never do wrong or return wrong for wrong. So effectively, eh, of course we should fulfill our agreements because to not fulfill agree an agreement, to cheat on an agreement that is just, is unjust. Eh? So, Socrates tends to think that this is the end of the argument. That's, that's just the end of it. Think about this for a minute. All right. Now, it seems clear that we cannot get me out of here based on that argument. All right. Crito's still not clear on this, so Socrates lays it out, and I am very glad Socrates lays it out because two very important concepts in political philosophy emerge as a result of this dialogue, right. it, which starts on 53. Effectively, this is, this is the first sort of thought experiment of this sort that I've ever seen. Uh, there have been others throughout the history of philosophy, but nonetheless, Socrates gives voice to an abstract entity, the laws of Athens. Right. He has sort of a faux conversation, a hypothetical conversation with the laws of Athens. Not the people who enact the laws of Athens, but the laws of Athens themselves. Right? Now, effectively, the laws of Athens point out that, whoa, whoa Socrates, what do you think of doing? Right? Are you so hostile to us that you would destroy the laws of Athens and what you're doing? Would you mistreat us in this way? Right? Or do you think it possible that a city, uh, for a city not to be destroyed if the verdicts of its course have no for, uh, force but are nullified and set uh, at naught by private individuals? What are we going to answer? Right? So effectively, if Socrates escapes, he is mistreating the laws of Athens. 
Okay, let's think this through. All right. The laws of Athens further down, you know, effectively you know, further the point. Was that the agreement between us, Socrates, or was it to respect the judgments of, that the city came to? You see, what Socrates, through taking up the voice of the laws of Athens, have, have done is pointed out that there is a formal agreement, a social contract between the city and state. Right? And they lay it out right, quite clearly. You were brought up and educated and defended in this city. Right? You were given legal protections to own property. You were married and had children within this city. You lived in this city your long life. Right? Sort of a weird duck, Socrates, except for military service, never left the city-state of Athens, not even for a festival or vacation or something along those lines. Socrates stayed in the city-state of Athens and took all of the goods, the social goods of that state. Think about yourself. You were educated. You used the infrastructure of, of, of your city, or of your state, right? You, 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 you are, to a certain extent, given a certain degree of health care within your state. You're given legal protections of the laws. You're given legal protections to own property. You own property in so far as the city-state defends your ability to own that property. Your marriages and your parents' marriages are certified as valid, binding, and fully recogni uh, recognizable right? because the state recognizes them, right? These are the things you get from the city-state. And in return, there's a simple kind of thing that you have to agree to. Obey the laws. Obey the laws. Right? But within the context of a democracy, our democracy, just like the democracy, or our democracies, I'm Canadian, so I have to pluralize there, um, just, just, just like the democracy of Athens, they do not issue harsh commands. Three options, really. It says two options, right? But nonetheless, right? You must either persuade it, the laws, or obey its orders and endure in silence whatever it instructs you to endure, whether uh, blows or bonds, and if it leads you into war to be wounded or killed, you must obey. To do so is right, and one must not give way or retreat or leave one's post, but both in war and in the courts and everywhere else, one must obey the commands of one city and country or persuade it as to the nature of justice. It's impious to bring violence to bear against your mother or your father. It's much more so to use it against your country. All right. Third option. All right. <clears throat> Third option All right. is that in Athens, they're not harsh. Other city-states, the laws point out, if you want to leave, you're free to leave, but we keep all your stuff. In Athens, you can conceivably take all of your stuff and move to another city-state if you don't like the agreement. If you find the laws to be unjust, you're not going to obey them, you're unable to persuade them, you can get up and go. You can just go. Three options. Now, if we look at Socrates' situation, right, he lived in Athens all of his long life. He told us in the Apology, this is his first time in front of the courts. He never attempted to persuade the laws to be more just. So he's given the one option. Right? He's down to one option. He didn't leave, he didn't persuade the laws, now he has to obey. Now, you might say, whoa, 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 when did I sign this agreement? Show me my signature. Where's the dotted line? That sort of thing. Well, here's the funny thing about these social contracts. 
Right? It's and I know in the states there's a pledge of allegiance, right? That sort of thing. That's more of a formal uh, form of consent, right? In, in Canada, it's a little. It's there is an oath of citizenship, but it, like it's I'm I'm a born natural citizen here. I've I've never taken an oath of citizenship, but nonetheless, I do renew my driver's license. I do renew my uh, my, my 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 healthcare card. Right? I file my taxes and that sort of thing, and I live here. I live here, and I perform my duties as a citizen. Right. I consent to the laws tacitly. It's an implied form of consent. Right? This is the agreement. Wait, how did I agree? By living here all of my life. Right? So, there's a mechanism here. Theory of justice. Credo. Socrates refuted that theory of justice. One must never do wrong. One must never return wrong and return for wrong. That's awkward. I'm sorry about that. Right. And one must fulfill one's agreements. Right. So, what's the agreement? It's a social contract. Obey the laws, persuade the laws, or go. Right. Socrates didn't per attempt to persuade the laws. Socrates didn't leave, so now he's got to obey the laws. When did he agree to this? Well, he was raised, educated, publicly argued throughout his long life, never leaving the city-state of Athens, that Athens was the, one of the best dang city-states that was out there. He was very impressed by the democracy and that sort of thing. And there are other places that, that he mentioned right, that were pretty good too, but nonetheless, Athens, he's an Athenian all the way, that sort of thing. So he tacitly implied his consent. right? to this social contract. So, by his own theory of justice, he's obligated to allow this verdict to be carried out. He had his day in court. No. So now when he's subject to the laws, he's going to overturn the laws because, man, I don't like those laws. That's, that's like how a teenager reacts to these things. Well, I didn't know the laws were like that. No, I don't know. Now that the laws are in, no. Right. And besides, right, first of all, right, in his trial defense, he publicly argued that he would prefer execution to exile. He knows exile's bad. He doesn't know what death is. So now he's going to scamper away like a frightened child? No. So let's say he does go into exile, what's he going to do? Having violated his own theory of justice, failed to fulfill the social contract, which he agreed to, is he going to Thessaly or Thebes or wherever and going to argue in public that one should care for justice and virtue more than all else? having violated his own theory of justice and done violence to another city-state, well, it's further than that, right? He will have shown himself to be hostile and an enemy to the laws of city-states generally, right? So he's going to show up and be an enemy to these city-states. What about the upbringing of his children, right? Well, two things with that. One, what would he teach his sons by violating his theory of justice and uh, the social contract? Nothing good, right? And two, remember that argument from Crato? It's, well, what, what'll happen to your children, right? And they'll probably have the same fate as, as all orphans, that sort of thing. And Socrates' point is like, what? If I'm executed, you're not going to take care of my children. But if I run away to Thessaly, you will take care of my children. That's not very cool. That's not friendship. Eh, that sort of thing. So you're going to take care of my children. Eh, simple as that. All right. So, um, boo -boo -boo -boo. so, yeah, towards the conclusion on 56. 
So you say, so you say you want to live for the sake of your children, that you may bring them up and educate them. How so? Will you bring them up and educate them by uh, taking them to Thessaly and making them str as strangers of them, that they may enjoy that too? Or not so, but they will be better brought up and educated here while you live, uh, while you are alive, though absent. Yes, your friends will look after them. Will they look after them if you go and live in Thessaly, but not if you go um, away to the underworld? If those who profess themselves your friends were any good at all, one must assume that they will. All right. So that's the credo. Right. On the one hand, this dialogue is how Socrates sort of literally argues himself to death. But on the other hand, what it does is shows a Socrates who cares so much for justice that he's willing to die for his theory of justice. I don't get the impression that Socrates wants to die. That's why he entertained this argument in the first place. But what he has done is he's demonstrated that he's bound by duties. And sometimes those duties, just like a duty to defend your country in a time of war, require you to do things you don't want to do. And a truly virtuous and courageous person will do what they are duty bound to do, whether or not they want to. Right. Now, additionally, this shows one other interesting feature of a democracy. Well, the apology was about rights and freedom of speech and the necessary conditions for functioning democracy and was Socrates being quite critical of the way democracy was being ha handled in Athens. This dialogue, on the other hand, is about duties in the context of a democracy. If the laws are unjust, right? and Socrates found these laws, the way they were being applied, were unjust. And what's more, he was quite critical of the way that a trial for one's life was being handled, namely that it was a day, not many days. Right? it would seem that before you're subject to such a trial, you would have an obligation, each and every one of us as citizens in a democracy, if we want laws to be just, we have an obligation to persuade the laws to be just. If the laws are unjust, we have to stand up and make an argument about this. Mm -hmm. Socrates, on the other hand, did not. Right? So it's his own shortcoming that got him into this situation. So now he has to take his licks. Right? So, well, in the context of democracy, there are these protected rights. There is a reason why these rights need to be protected, namely so that it means something when we vote. Our votes have to be persuaded by reason. And we ought to have that space to actually publicly debate and discuss and reason through right? our various positions that then shape the laws and shape the nature of a democracy. It's necessary. Otherwise, a democracy isn't a democracy. Otherwise, we are, you know, keeping quiet because of the possibility of legal sanctions right? or physical harm. Right. On the other hand, we have a duty to engage with this democratic apparatus, right? not just because we're subject to these laws, but because everybody is subject to these laws and we want our democracy to be as just as possible right? for everybody who le le uh, lives in it. Right? So reason is the key for Socrates. We should have protected rights, but we should, on the other hand, discharge our duties as well. Right? So fundamentally, right, this is what Socrates argues a democracy is. All right. Well, I look forward to your forum responses and um, whatnot. All right. Good days. One for each of you.